what I want to help you do is think about the future, the changes, the creativity that's in all of us, that's in the world, that makes this the most incredible moment in the history of humanity. There's never been a better day than today. There's never been a better year than 2017, but it won't be good unless we think about it, unless we get together, hold hands mentally, and ensure we can work for a better future. We're at a crossroads of humanity. Will this be the best century ever, or is this our final century? Those choices are ours. Those are the choices we have to make starting today and every day of our lives, individually and together. It's an extraordinary time. It's a time of discovery. And it all happens because of things that happen very near here. The Berlin Wall coming down, separation ending, ideas traveling at unprecedented speed, and we move from a world where only about 400 million people were connected in the 1980s to a world of six billion people connected today. An incredible thing. Five and a half billion more connected people. It changes everyone's lives. It changes all of ours in fundamental ways. I thought this was about Eastern Europe. I was working in Paris. I didn't imagine for a moment that it would transform my life. I'm a South African. I was born there. I was in exile. I couldn't go back. Within four months of the war coming down, Nelson Mandela was released. Six months later, he came to Paris and asked me to be his economic advisor. And what I realized in that is that things that seem totally unconnected to us will cascade and shape our lives in dramatic ways, and that's happening at accelerated speed. We see it in the Arab Spring. We see it everywhere. This pace of change, it's a tumultuous time. How do we gain perspective? How do we make sense of what's happening? And our failure to make sense is what's driving people backwards to protectionism, nationalism, xenophobia. We need new perspective, and I believe we can gain that. The Arab Spring teaches us a very important lesson. It's not simply about more and more openness and more and more connectivity. It's about surprise. The only certainty is more surprise. What we see in Syria, what we see in Egypt and so many other places is what was connected is being disconnected as well. So it's not an exact a process that will carry on inevitably. We need to fight for it. We need to fight for connectivity and openness. It is not inevitable, as we've seen in too many places. And as we think about this, we need to realize, too, that this process has unleashed incredible talent. Two billion more people in the world since the Berlin Wall came down. And that's because ideas have traveled. Simple ideas, like washing your hands, prevent contagious diseases, Wearing a seatbelt keeps you alive. Smoking kills you. Ideas like that traveling around the world and new technologies, new vaccines, new cures for cancer. Two billion more people. And with that, an extraordinary thing, because it's not only that we move from a world of five billion people where only one billion were literate, but a world now of seven billion where five billion are literate, four billion more literate people over a period of 30 years. And if you believe in the random distribution of exceptional talent, there's just a lot more geniuses out there that will shape our lives. The Mozart, Shakespeare's, Einstein's emerging from the streets of Mumbai, Soweto, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, and elsewhere. But it's not only individuals that change the world, it's teams, it's exceptional teams, it's people sparking off each other like they will do here at DLD, like we have to do. And that's happening at unprecedented speed. So our group working in Oxford on new cures for cancer is working on a 24-hour research cycle with data in the cloud. We'll find new cures. Timeless, different, structurally a step change in humanity's capacity to create. We move from a world when I first went to China in 1981, there were only 78 people doing doctoral degrees. This year, there are 300,000 people doing doctoral degrees. This transformation of formal and informal learning will change all of our lives. The engine of creativity has been turned on in unprecedented ways. And that's why when you look at this period in the long sweep of the last 2,000 years, you see this most remarkable, extraordinary thing that means this is the best time in human history to be alive. You see income growth, that's red, exponential, the right-hand axis. Population growth, that's green, Arithmetic, that's the left-hand axis. Both more rapid than ever in history, but now income growth exceeding population at a much, much greater speed. And that's why people are escaping poverty. That's why the world is a better place. That's why I'm an optimist, despite everything I see in the world around me. This is the best time to be alive.
It's certainly the best time to be born in poverty because one's chance of escaping poverty are greater than ever in history. Except, as Angus Deaton, who got the Nobel Prize, reminds us, in pockets like the Midwest of the US or the north of England or parts of Africa where people's chance of escaping poverty are lower than their parents. That means growing inequality. And that's what's driving anger and resentment. But the aggregate story is a beautiful one. And the question looking forward, and all of you should have life expectancies which are 20 years greater than your parents, is what's next. Will this continue? Are these incredible curves likely to continue and their movement up? And I'm going to come back to that. But we need to celebrate this moment, and we need to, in the face of so much negativism and pessimism, realize just how extraordinary this is, not least for women, not least for young girls, who are the engine of the future. And so when we think about this time, what reference point can we get? What can we make sense of? And I believe while some have talked about this as the fourth and even fifth industrial revolution, there's a more compelling story to be told, and that's about the Renaissance. We are in a new Renaissance, because this isn't simply about industrial processes. This is about the way we think. This is about the way we connect. And this isn't like the industrial revolutions, which still haven't reached all over the world. This is transforming the whole world in a simultaneous way. It's more like a Renaissance moment. That was a time when humanity changed perspective. It took Europe from being one of the most backward places in the world, thinking that there were dragons on the edge, to one of the, the most advanced place by far within a space of 70 years. It was transformative, and it happened around here, where we're sitting today. It really was a most extraordinary transformation. It created a round world, Mercator's projection, from a world that wasn't. It transformed the way that everyone understood things. Copernicus, that the world, went, Earth went around the sun, not the sun around the Earth. Physical and mental maps were, re were redrawn in a very short space of time. And of course, leading on to the Galileos and many others. Driven by information technologies. Then the Gutenberg Press. Before that, only monks in Latin could read and write in their monasteries. Less than 1% of, of Europe was literate. And suddenly, this revolutionized the traveling of ideas. And you got this takeoff. And the cheapening of print allowed everyone to participate. And that's what drove the Renaissance, just like our technological transformations today. And so when we celebrate the Renaissance, and I spent Florence, the month of October in Florence, and trying to understand in these streets what happened, why, and where did it go wrong, because what started as a celebration ended in jihadism and tears. Savonarola, an extremist monk, taking over and deposing the Medicis, convincing people that change was bad, that change threatened their lives, that if they went with it, they were being corrupted, because they were corrupt. Society was, and the church was. You could buy your way to heaven with indulgences. And so, it ended in these wonderful streets of Florence, in the bonfire of the vanities, the burning of books, the hounding of intellectuals, the creation of alternative visions of the world with Luther's ideas going viral using the same technologies, the counter force with the inquisitions, and of course, the spreading of bads as well as goods. The ships that went off and discovered the Americas spreading diseases that killed most Native Americans, the unintended systemic risks associated with early globalization, and a massive anti-intellectualism and anti-expert tendency that we see mirrored and echoed across Europe and in the US today. This is what the Renaissance brought us. This is what rapid transformation did, and we need to learn the lessons as has already been said by Steffi and Dominique and others, we need to be in control and we need to understand that these forces aren't inevitably good. We need to manage them. What are the two key things that worry me? While the walls have come down between societies, within societies, they are going up everywhere. All countries in the world are experiencing rising inequality. And the reason is that when things change faster, people get left behind quicker. And so you have to worry more and more as the pace of change accelerates about 
bringing society along with you. You need to worry about whether people can get to move to their new jobs, whether they can commute, how they're going to leave home, how they're going to acquire their technologies, how they're going to get re-educated, and you need to worry about social safety nets. And the second big worry is that not only good things spread, bad things spread too. The underbelly of globalization is contagion, cascading risk, what I call the butterfly defect of globalization. You all know the butterfly effect from Lorentz and the spreading of things. And this carries in finance, in pandemics, in cyber, and in many, many other areas. So where are we going? When we look at the population demographics, we see this most extraordinary story. We see we, a need to remove from our mental maps ideas of population pyramids and put in place structures like this. This could be Germany, by the way, very similar to Italy. Many details are important in these. One of them is the obvious thing that jumps out of this, that women are more wise than men. They live longer, they're born to live to the same age, but they live longer because they don't make as many stupid decisions. They don't smoke as much, they don't drink as much, they don't drive as many fast cars into each other, they don't stick as many knives into each other, and they live longer. But the opposite is happening at the bottom. Too many young boys. Because when you live in society and you're moving to only having one child, and the societies give better career prospects, income, status to boys, people around the world are choosing boys. And so this is one of the highlights. Of course, the massive weight of this is important. When retirement packages were built, average life expectancy was seven years on retirement, average real risk adjusted returns were 4%. Now average life expectancy is 25 years and real risk adjusted returns are half if you're lucky. You have to save 100 times more. Elderly people will hold wealth and this will have dramatic consequences. They will also hold their jobs. Every society is different. Of course, China one-child policy has a dramatic effect. Gender imbalance is very significant. The US a beehive structure much better, and that's because of immigration. This was done before Trump. He could kill this goodness. <laughs> Half the children born in the U.S. today born to immigrant parents. So median ages doubling around the world, dramatic consequences for politics, economics, and everything else. Migration becoming much more significant with the workforce declining by about 100 million people in the OECD countries, but also in China, where the work workforce this year is 1.6 million less than it was last year. The emerging markets taking over increasingly. We already see two-thirds of the change in production coming from emerging markets. This is wonderful news. Average growth rates of emerging markets, 4.5%. Average growth rates of advanced economies, 1.7%. They are pulling the world up. The engines of change have multiplied and of growth, and that means the global growth will also be more stable. So we see this pattern of emerging markets becoming 80% of global production and commerce. We see many emerging markets overtaking many of the advanced economies. This is wonderful news. And of course, per capita depends on the combination of the number of people. Consumption shares, you see the emerging markets, particularly Asia, that's in red. The growth in these, quite phenomenal. And these are the different shares of global consumption. The different shades at the bottom up to the lime green, which is Japan, being Asia. And you see the US, that's the dark blue, being squeezed. Light blue Europe, much more significant than the US. One of the many, many reasons why Brexit was such a stupid idea is that the Europe will be much more significant for Britain than US going forward, as it will be for the rest of the world. Can it happen? Is there enough resource? Is there enough water, atmosphere? Oceans, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Let me just whiz through some technologies that are going to shape our lives, and that's what we know, and there'll be many sessions on this. The one thing about all predictions is that they're going to be wrong, but we need to think more about them, and we need to think about the future more, even though we know we're wrong, because that's what the rest of our lives are about. That's what the planet's about. So getting the structural shifts right is very important. We're very easy with hindsight to know what's not cool, all these devices, of course, replaced by one. But a stable process is Moore's Law. I have about 40 people in the Oxford Martin School working around this, the doubling of processing speed every year. So we have about a million times the power for the same price in 20 years. We don't know what we're going to do with it. But it will continue to shape everything, including, of course, the Internet. 
One of the incredible things that we can do is build at the molecular level. This is from my nanomedicine lab. And what you see here is a nanoneedle going through an individual cancer stem cell at a speed of 44 billionths of a second. The ability to build at this level, the molecular and atomic level. The revolutions which are occurring, this is from the Oxford Martin School stem cell lab, the stem cell lab I created. The ability to recreate different cell groups in the body. They will transform our possibilities. We're just at the beginning of the creation process. And of course, many of these things with fundamental effects on humanity. These are different... Um, get them going. The back mouse is a dramatic, genetically modified mouse. The front mouse is a slightly modified mouse. Julian Savaleski will talk to this uh, in the session which follows. But the capacity to change the way things are. The back mouse drops out after about 20 minutes, 200 meters. The front mouse goes for two hours, two kilometers. Exact same mice, slight genetic improvement, 10 times the power. This is what's coming in. And as we understand it, and it's even more powerful in the mental sphere, we need to make some really fundamental decisions about what we as humanity will be going forward, how we want to be, who's going to have this. Is this going to increase inequality or is it going to decline? And as we get into genomics, this will become even more powerful, the capacity to change our DNA structures with fantastically significant implications for productivity, but most significantly for ethics, for inequality, and for everything else. DNA sequencing coming down exponentially in price with Moore's law, incredible. But with this, not only the capacity to improve our DNA, but to create new pathogens. We need to remember that it's individuals that have become more powerful in this age. We, for the first time in history, have individuals that are more powerful than nation states. And one of the ways they can do it is to create a biopathogen. Another way they can do it, like Nick Leeson showed us, um, is to bring down a bank. This is new. This capacity of individuals to leverage new technologies in incredible new ways. Systemic risk is not new. We know in England that a rat coming off a ship might have killed 30% or 40% of the population. What's new? is the speed of transmission with globalization. So a swine flu starting in Mexico City is in 160 days in 30 days. That's new. Our emerging infections group has shown it exactly replicates airline traffic. So the super spreaders of the goods of globalization are also the super spreaders of the bad. And of course, in the fiber system, in the internet, in the web, we see this writ large. And as it comes into our bodies, as we become cyber orgs, this trust and integrity issue becomes more and more significant. And we're already beta testing various devices in the body. So it's not only that your bank account gets opened or your front door locked or your vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, it's that you get controlled by a hack. So how we think about trust and integrity becomes more and more significant. My colleague Carl Frey in the Oxford Martin School's Technology and Jobs Group will talk about the implications this afternoon on jobs, but we've predicted that 47% of US jobs may be lost to machine intelligence that are vulnerable to this. How will people feel about this when they are taken? And how do we ensure that people feel comfortable, that they don't see technology as a threat? Here in Germany, GMOs and nuclear power have been banned. It's not that technologies exist, it's how people feel about them that shapes the way they will transform societies. So as we think about this handshake, as we think about our evolution, and connectivity to the world of artificial intelligence. Let's think back to the Renaissance. Let's think back about how we manage this. We don't want machines to disintermediate us. I don't think that will happen. But we need to be in control. We need to ensure that this fear that many people have, for good reason, is not manifest. That we are able to do this handshake in new ways. That we are able to ensure that we add up the different dimensions of globalization. This is not least when it comes to natural resources. We know that if everyone does the same thing, the sum of their actions will be disastrous. We know that markets alone cannot determine allocation, as with rhinoceros horns, or with antibiotic resistance, or, of course, with climate change. So managing these collective action problems, these global commons, becomes more and more significant as the number of us connect. This is the fish market in Tokyo. This is the tuna that sold for 1.5 million euro. 
This is the market's response to the scarcity of natural resources. The price goes up, and then, of course, you get extinction. So how we allocate scarce resources in this world, where everyone will have access, or many and more people will have access, becomes more and more significant. We're going to have to accept more restrictions on our individual liberties, and for many of us, this is not an easy thought. But how we manage this and ensure that it's fair and equitable, that those that still need to climb the energy curve or still need access to water can have it. Governments are not very good at this. This is the Aral Sea, shared by six countries, unable to manage it. And as we move into this age, we, these institutions that were meant to manage the world are totally unfit for 21st century purpose. There's a rearranging of the furniture, but it is not scaled to the challenge. And that's for good news, too. The world's moved on from where 12 white men smoking cigars could set the rules. New powers have risen, but we have no captain on planet Earth. We need to take control and ensure that our connectivity gives us guidance, that we aren't simply confused, and even the best of our institutions are. The IMF the best of the global institutions by far, totally unable to see the financial crisis. So as we move forward, let's not let the forces of darkness that want to take us back to a pre-globalized world win. We can understand why people feel this, why people are anxious. We can understand why people want to pull out. We can understand why there's an attack on trade, why there's an asterisk type of mentality, why Trump is in power. But we need to be very careful that we understand the fundamental concerns which are real, which people have about globalization. We are entangled. Trump is misguided because the US cannot disconnect. Disconnection is not an option. We have to work on this together. We need to be connected but protected. And what we see is this possibility. Age of Discovery, which I'll talk about it for this afternoon, tries to understand this in reference to the future. And I hope that you find it inspiring. There was wisdom then, and we have wisdom now. That was the most beautiful renaissance, and we in a new renaissance. The challenge for us all is to ensure that we don't end like the Medicis and the Florentines, that we're able to nurture this and rock on to a very happy old age. Thank you very much.